Okay, my name is Dave Packham. Um, a nerd by uh, guilt and admission, and uh, I work up at the University of Utah, and I work with a great group of guys, and we run a lot of services up there, but I also have a lot of rabbit holes that I jump down at home. Um, and one of them is security. I've been a security guy um, forever. Uh, way back when, um, at WordPerfect, I was their security guy when we hooked up to the internet with a 9600 baud modem. Um, and I actually ran a BBS, if you guys remember what BBSs are, I actually ran a BBS at WordPerfect where we allowed people to download pirated software. <coughs> uh, they were floppy disk images at the time. And we worked with this, it was right when the Software Privacy Association the started up and they were trying to figure out how to track people and we would allow people to download WordPerfect 4.2 on floppy disk and we would um, encode their phone number that they called in on in each copy of the disk that they downloaded. And then it was my job to go to all these other BBSs. Anybody remember Rusty's and Edie's in the Iowa? That was a huge popular one. And we'd go download our stuff back to us and try and track it and draw a big old map. Um, but as part of that, I had to accrue quite a bit of wares myself so that our BBS, uh, least at landing, if you ever saw that, um, was popular enough to be there. So we did a lot of work. And um, mouse is not going to function for me today. So we'll have to use the keyboard. Um, so security... Uh, you know, a lot of people in the room think that this is securities. Um, unicorn, spark, glitter, and everything is happy and cool, right? Um, at least from the suit level. Do we have any suit C-level, V-level people in the room? Anybody? One? Okay. What's your name? Yeah. Brian. Brian. Okay, we can talk about Brian. <laughs> and who do you work for, Brian? Adventus? Oh, they're not here either, so we can rip them too. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> um, so working at a university, it's a, it's a unique scenario. So you just heard from um, someone who worked for the hospital part of the university, and I work for the campus part of the university, and we always refer to ourselves as suits and hippies trying to work together. And we have two very different um, attack methods for security. And... You know, when we're in security, and the name, you know, part of the name of my talk is Doom. So, what what is Doom? What do we what do we look at? What do we think when we talk about Doom? Um, some of the predictions out there are pretty doomish. Uh, if you read the blogs, you listen to the podcasts, and you think uh, with your head on straight, not about your current job tasks today, but you think um, this is this is a quite very good option. And by the year 2020, all the attacks, or 99% of the attacks, will hit vectors that are one year old. Okay? We're so concerned about patching, and we're so concerned about these vulnerability scans that we get. My group gets them from our security guys, and they say, hey, you've got three criticals, four of this, and 19 of these, and 200 of these. You know, which ones are we going to go after first? Okay. By 2020, which would be a great year, it's funny that we're actually talking about 2020 as something that's tangible, right? That was like a movie back in the day. By the year 2020, we're all flying in spaceships and unicorns fart glitter. Um, but by 2020, think about this. Think about this at the CEO level. Um, by the year 2020, a third of the hacks that will happen to any company, corporation, EDU, will happen to shadow IT resources. And does everybody know what a shadow IT resource is? Okay, I, I did see a lot of hands, so I'm going to explain it for a second. A shadow IT resource is something that, as a policy comes out and they say, hey, to run in this VM on-prem, you have to apply by these security standards and these security metrics, 
and you have to talk to the NOC to get the firewall change, and you have to talk to ISO to get the security change, and you have to do this, and you have to do this and this and this, right? Shadow IT comes up on the other hand, and they say, hey, we're developers, and um, developers are the ultimately cool people, right? Right? And just in test mode, we're going to spin up an AWS server, right? And we're going to spin up a Google server, and we're going to test our stuff out there. And oh, whoops, it went into production, right? You just completely bypassed your ISO guys, your NOC guys, your everything guys, because now you can set everything up. So they've set up a shadow IT shop in their own shop underneath your umbrella. And a third of those are going to be hacked, and they're completely out of your control. Okay, by 2019, this is coming up pretty soon. By 2019, token use, duo, two-factor authentication, is going to drop by 55%. Why? Because there's been some recent announcements by Google, for one. They announced recently, and if you look through the Verge website or a couple of the websites, you'll, say, you'll, see, you'll see articles from Google that say, hey, we think because of the recent hacks that 2FA may not be the cool unicorn stuff that we thought it was. We're going to look into better authentication factors, and possibly it's going to require us to carry around a little USB stick that we have to stick in things, right? Because software can be hacked or mimicked or man in the middle. And then we have other vendors. Um, sorry, I got a cold, so can't talk very well. We have other vendors that are coming out and taking off physical security devices, like the iPhone X, iPhone 10. Which one is it? X 10? The X 10? Okay. <laughs> um, with the unibrow on the top of the screen, is that it? Um, they, you know, they got rid of the physical security sensor, and they scan your face now. Do you guys know why? Did you read the memo of why the face scan thing didn't work when he presented the phone? He had two iPhone 10s, or Xs. He had an, a 10 and an X, okay? And one of them was out on the stage staring at the ceiling, and one of them was his, in his hand, and he was walking around going, guess what I get to demo? Dudes, look at this. Look, that's cool. That's cool, right? He gets to the stage, and he's like, hey, so I'm going to demo face unlock. Didn't quite work, right? Well, the developers tore it apart when they got back, and they found that it had scanned like 39 faces, right? So if I had an iPhone X and I went like this, it would scan about 50 faces, right? Or something close to that. So security guys in me starts thinking, hmm, okay, I'm sitting on, I'm on a train every morning, and now all of a sudden, you know, I, I run Android, this is a Pixel, and it does face recognition. Pixel 2 came out with something like this. I'm like, front and back cameras are now scanning people's faces and drawing databases of people's faces, right? Think London with their security cameras and face tracking recognition. Think um, NCIS Cyber, which was such a great show, made it one whole season. Um, think about that kind of thing. So we're moving into something that you can't fudge. You can't fudge your face. Uh, you can't fudge a USB key, <coughs> right? So we're moving into those things. Latest corporate hacks. Uh, these are not small companies. A couple of these companies on the list, we've actually paid rather large sums of money to, to come in and tell us how to do security. There's some irony here. I mean, Deloitte, if you look through their security briefings, you know, I've, I've read, heard a lot of podcasts on this and listened to a lot of people on this, and they're like, you know, you've got to give them some slack because Deloitte's like 50 companies all bundled into one, and to try and put out a security policy for a 50-partner company that's really one company is really difficult, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, maybe should they should do an assessment on themselves or something. But these and Equifax. Equifax's job is to drag data about us that we didn't request them to drag data about, just so that we can get a loan by another unicorn. So there's some big companies out there, and we're all excited about these big companies helping us out, right? Um, but in one hand, you have these kind of people, 
And then on the other hand, <laughs> okay, this is one of my all-time favorite funny videos. I don't know if you guys seen this. This sort of reminds me of corporate level type things, and I've actually seen and been in meetings that have been sort of like this, where the focus isn't quite right. All these guys have binoculars on backwards, right? And they're trying to play soccer, and they're trying to see the ball, and it's just sort of hilarious. And you think about, think about, a, think about the latest meeting you've been in with a lot of people, and they're talking about security policy or privacy or something like that. And it, it's sort of like this, isn't it? Okay, that goes on for a long time. <coughs> Not to be ironic either. But uh, so, then, so then where do these hacks happen? I mean, where does all this corporate data end up? It ends up in the same place that those corporations put some of their code, right? So everybody uses Git, right? Right, everybody? At some point, a lot of stuff is out on GitHub. Working for a university, we open source almost everything, so a lot of our stuff is publicly available. Right next to the big dumps, here's all the NSA's hacker tools, right? GitHub would be a really cool place to hack, if it hasn't already been. I mean, if you listen to some of the keynotes we've had, right, one statement was made, there are those people who know they've been hacked and the people who don't know they've been hacked but have been, he com completely missed a group on purpose of com people that weren't hacked, right? So we're all hacked. And how do they do it? I mean, I don't know if this was a disgruntled employee. I don't know if this was a hacker posing as an employee. But he just posted access to their VPN. And then posted a couple RDP server names. And then the community went wild and started looking for RDP servers. And if you notice down in the bottom right-hand corner, for you guys, uh, it's sort of funny that the server is waiting to be rebooted for patching. So I have to tell you, we went to a uh, Ignite conference a couple, uh, last year. And in this Ignite conference, we were talking, watching a presentation for the uh, Exchange Online guys. And they said, hey, we have a million servers that run Exchange. We have a bunch of drives and all these million servers, and they're all over the world. And we have all these bugs and all these problems. And we went to our developers and said, hey, how can we fix these problems that we're having with Exchange? And they grokked about it, and they chewed on it, and they went and consulted their unicorns. And they came back and they said, hey, you know, let's put the developers into the loop of support for these prog products. So all of a sudden the developers are now ops, right? DevOps, has anyone heard of that? Okay, go figure. So they put the developers in the loop for support and every developer had to run through a task or a, a two week period in support. And they got to the point where they're like, oh man, this totally sucks. Can't believe how you guys do this. I'm gonna write all these checks to check all these things and do all these things. And now Exchange, just as one example, has all this built-in mechanisms to self-recover and self-heal. But they still had this huge pile of tickets that they had to, had to resolve. So they took this big data and they took it off and they went to their da big data scientists, right, which is another unicorn title. And they said, what, what can we do, big data guys, to get rid of the majority of these tickets. And the ticket guys came, or the big data guys came back and said, okay, we got a solution for you. We can get rid of 52% of your tickets by doing two simple things. Every week, reboot every server. Windows servers. Once a week, reboot them. Dismount the databases, move people off, reboot the machine, do a check, hardware check. On week two, take the machine down, re-image the C drive, 
bring it back up, and put it back in load. They implemented this and 52% of their tickets went away. Let that sink in for a second. So they admitted to us, and it was, a, it was the exact same response as you guys just gave me. There was like 10,000 people in the room, and we're all just like, <gasps> what? <laughs> what? One week? Okay, cool. So one week. Reboot your servers every week, and 52% of your problems will go away. So my mind jumps around just a little bit, and I recently uh, was the victim of a house fire. And uh, here is the source point of contact. So I've been living out of a hotel for three weeks now, and boy, isn't that fun. Um, we've eaten at every fast food restaurant in American Fork, there possibly is. Um, but our grandkids love it because we're about 200 yards from Corn Bellies at Thanksgiving point. But I want to put in a pitch for one thing, technology. Does everybody know what a WAF, the WAF factor is? Right? There's a hand in the back. The WAF factor is the wife acceptance factor for me. For you, you can translate it into however you want. But for me, the WAF in my home automation system was very important. You have to keep the WAF between 1 and 10. The closer to 10, the happier your significant other is right? And she was home at the time. I wasn't. I was sitting at work, and all of a sudden, my phone starts to freak out. You know, and it's cool messages like, uh, dude, your house is on fire. <laughs> 30 seconds later, I'm trying to figure out on my phone what's going on, right? 30 seconds later, I get a call from my daughter, and she's like, yeah, dad, dad, our house is on fire. I'm like, get out. What are you doing? I'm taking pictures. It's like, <laughs> you're 24, get out. And the funny thing was, she didn't even single, take a single picture in the whole thing. She was worried about her fish downstairs. So they went and checked, and the home automation system, the Nest Protect, talked to my wife and child and said, hey, in a very pleasant voice, said, hey, I'm a piece of technology your husband put in and that you didn't think was right, because we paid a lot of money for it, the Nest protects 100 bucks. The Nest thermostat's 169, something like that, for 200 bucks. The Nest Protect actually talked to her and said, hey, there's smoke in your house. You should get out. An alarm will sound in three seconds. Three, two, one. Don't be scared. And every 30 seconds, it would talk to her. So she ran downstairs, and I have another Nest Protect downstairs, and she walked by the Nest Protect downstairs, and the Nest woke up and said, hey, you're still in the house. You need to get out now. There's a fire upstairs. And she finally got out. At the same time, the Nest Protect told my Nest thermostat to shut off. And it completely stopped the fire. So all I had was a charred up furnace. And that's all I have to replace. And three weeks of fast food while they're cleaning and wiping down the house. But something you didn't know that you could probably take into IT with you, and I want to show a raise of hands if anybody has actually knows this data. Your fire detector in your house degrades its effectiveness at 3% a year. And at 30%, it's ineffective to tell you quick enough that the fire has started. My daughter and wife were outside with the firemen watching smoke billow out of the house when the smoke detectors that came with the house finally turned on. And that freaked her out. She's like, dude, your budget has just increased, replaced everything. <laughs> She's like, if I was laying in bed with smoke, black smoke hovering over me for three and a half minutes, I'd probably be dead. Did you guys know that? If you've been in your home longer than 10 years and haven't changed all your smoke detectors, that they're completely ineffective? Anybody? Okay, a couple. If you have a nest, it'll actually tell you. It'll talk to you and say, hey, I'm getting near my end of life. Start budgeting to replace me, whatever, right? 
It's your home. It's your life. Got some funding. So translate this into IT. How many processes, how many servers, how many procedures, how many code bases have we deployed that degrade in effectiveness over three years or some certain percent, and we're still running them? Everybody in this room has a server they wish they could shoot. Right? Everybody does. So I have a few questions for the, the Cheezos in the room. Um, CISOs, however you want to pronounce it. Okay. Do you know, and for the security guy, do you know every device that's on your network? Who here knows about every single device that's on their network? Anybody? Not home network. <laughs> I, well, even home network. Literally, I mean, how many, how many times has your kid given out the Wi-Fi password to their friend? Or your front door lock combo? We had a, we were at dinner before the fire. At dinner, sitting there, me and my wife. We hardly ever see our other daughter. All of a sudden, we hear a beep, 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 beep. And that's not the same amount of digits. I changed the number of digits. So you can't social engineer me. <laughs> the door opened. Some girl we didn't know walked in, walked downstairs. It's like... Okay, that's cool. So do you know everything that's on your network? Because they're going to ask the accountant if they know where every dollar is. Isn't that a fair question for the Chizo? Okay. Do you have a tight security policy around all the things on your network? Everybody, a lot of people here are from the EDU space, right? We're sort of screwed to start with, right? We all have students. We all have guests. We all have visitors to our company. And that's going to impact our security policy. We're going to have to have guest networks. We're going to have to have guest access. And if you're an EDU, you're going to have to let them into your private unicorn stable, right, where you keep all the treasures. Again, do you know what shadow IT is? You guys need to be really, really aware of this. Um, me and my group, we've actually purchased several tools that run off-prem that do something better than what on-prem does. Our CEO, CTO, has recently said and come out in a, in a meeting and said, hey, there will be no free software in my organization without me, architecture, and security guys knowing about it. And everybody went, uh, uh, what about Slack? We all use Slack. Okay. Entry vector. Is your security policy creating shadow IT? Do you have a policy that's so tough that people are saying, oh, dang it, working with the knock guys, that sucks. Their procedure is like, put in a ticket, wait 10 days, they'll talk about it. And then some dude named Brad Brennan gets it, and when he gets in, he'll probably take care of it. And then he won't send you an email, and then two days later, five days later, you test it and it's broke, right? Well, that was the position we were in like five, eight years ago. But there's three knock guys from our department staring at me right now going, that's not how it is. And I got to give them props. They have done a crap load of work. Thank you very much. And they're actually massively responsi responsive. They get this stuff done. And they even will tolerate a drive-by shooting from me. I'll go over there to Ken's desk all the time and say, hey, dude, can you help me with this firewall? And he'll say, yes, Dave. Thank you, Ken. So are we creating it? How easy is it for me to create an account on AWS and do the networking myself. Allocate my own disk, do my own firewall, just for test. And is it because my CTO came up in a meeting and said, no free software, can't do it? Did my CTO push me over the edge to be a shadow IT department, right? 
apportioning for all the guys who work for us? No, we've approved everything. But do you know where your data is in your company? Do you know what's happening to the network? The CISO should know where his data resides. He should know where the gold eggs are, where the silver eggs are, where the bronze eggs are. And he should be able to say, I know for a certainty this data is here and it's staying there. It's the platinum service, I know where it is. Or, is this your data? So we always talk about the north, south, east, west, right? Everybody knows that. North, south is stuff leaving and entering your company. East, west is stuff inside your company. Does your company look more like this? Is there just every entry vector in the world for all your crap? And, you know, that's why your Chizo is bald, right? Because he's just losing his hair, trying to worry about all this stuff. Um, Jerry's a privacy guy up at the U. I'm sure he's had several sleepless nights thinking about data and where it is. What do we do? Old school hacks. People used to try to offload 800 gig really quick before you could catch them, right? But now we're starting to see slow stuff. Several of the recent hacks have been 500 meg files or slow tran even slower transfers. Can you tell me, or can someone in your NOC tell me where an an anomalous 500 meg transfer came from? That fits into the genre of I just downloaded something or I just binge watched, you know, the new black at work, right? So we don't know where the data is. Sometimes people don't notice what's going on until we put a knackle in front of them, right? Our guys are cleaning up our ackles, and it's a tremendous process, tremendous. Many late nights and many phone calls saying, oh, hey, uh, Ken, firewall guy, uh, my stuff doesn't work now, what happened? And Ken will come back to me and say, hey, remember when I came to your office last Thursday and talked to you about these subnets? Yeah. And you said it was okay for me to block these subnets? I'm like, oh, crap. Yeah. Well, I blocked them. Like, okay, let's figure it out. So how do you solve shadow IT? Uh, block TCP any any? That would work. See who raises their hand and goes, hmm, hey guys. But if you're a security guy, you're thinking about that guy sitting in the corner who didn't raise his hands. And he's like, hmm, I'm already out there. I don't care. As a Chizo or as a security guy, do you know your users that well? Or do you focus myopically on just your stuff? How far into their world are you? How far do you think about them and grind on what their process is and what you're trying to affect a change with them? There are people that we target, <laughs> no hint, no pun there, and if you look at the red concentric circles, you'll think about another hack that we had recently. And yeah, my wife was pissed. She couldn't use her credit card during last Thanksgiving or two Thanksgivings ago, right? Because she went to Target to buy milk, of all things. We never go to Target to buy milk. Who goes to Target to buy milk? Anyways, so we, we pinpoint this one department or this one person, and we think about them so far that we're stuck. And we can't see past that one person. And we can't see past that one protocol or that one thing. Do you have a person in your infrastructure or in your org chart identified as a global thinker? Is there a person whose job is to think above your group and say, okay, my group's focusing on this over here. 
shouldn't we be focusing on this or this or this? Sort of at the CISO level, but they're in so many meetings, right? They all have their neck choked with a tie and suit. They're working on other policies and procedures. But there needs to be one security guy thinking outside the box, outside my job responsibilities, finding out why is this log file so huge? Why is it different? Is there a CIO or CEO or minion or whatever logging in in the middle of the night from Bangalore or China? I don't know how to say I love you in those languages. Um, but what's different? So, for the security guy and for the security officers, can you answer these questions? Should you answer these questions? Should you open up the curtains to your organization a little bit and say, N -y no, you know what, we're focusing on this massive project that you've given us and we're not focusing on these, right? I believe you should. It gets harder and harder nowadays to have an open conversation, especially when it's brutal, with people to come to you from the firewall team and say, dude, these firewall echoes are crap. You can't do an any any. Right? Ken, Ken love the guy. He comes to me all the time and he's like, No, Dave, not an any any. I'm like, Oh, man, it's so easy. <laughs> right? We were debugging a, pro a problem the other day with backups. And we got, a, we got an any any put in just to, just to debug it. Ken walked by. I think he smelled something. <laughs> he smelled the crap coming out of the office. And he's like, um, yeah, we'll need a list of ports. Because, you know, when we move to this new folk, we're not going to do any any's. Right? So, I, so go back to your Cisco guys and have them grep for the word any. And then work on it from there. So, consider the following in several different levels of maturity. Do you patch your old systems? How many people patch? Right, everybody should patch. Monthly, quarterly, like Microsoft every week, right? Really? Wow, dude, hire that kid. All right. Do you focus on the more needy patch systems? Do you have systems that you can't patch because it'll break the vendor? Where do you focus? We have several services we can't upgrade Java on. Go figure, right? Because then we can't use the administration console anymore. You gotta run Java 1.6. That's all we certified on. It's like, oh man, ackle that baby off. But we focus on other systems. Do we work in these new paradigms in our organization? Are we agile? Right? Why don't they call it old fart? Why don't, are we old farts? Right? Are we whatever the new term is? Are we doing the new scrum? Are we in the two week chase? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you guys work for companies that actually make money off of their, their stock, right? And the more product you ship, the more money you make. So what's gonna be your focus? Ship the product, get it out there. Go fast, burn fast. I have a neighbor who's totally 100% burn fast guy. He's a serial CEO, he takes a job, he, he loves taking failing companies and then make him do double digits, triple digits in sales. He'll run them for three or four years, take his 51% and sit on his back deck for another three or four years looking for the next one. And we had this conversation one day. He's like, Dave, you've been in IT for 30 plus years, 35, 37 years. You've been at WordPerfect for 12, University of Utah for 19. You're sort of a consistency guy, right? What's the difference between us? And I'm like, well, you make a crap load of money 
twice every 10 years. I make a consistent amount of money, and if we compare, we both live in the same neighborhood, right? He just gets a new car every couple of years. And I was talking to him about his product, and he actually agreed that he had made decisions at some point in his career, several points in his career, to ship a product, to get it to the customer, to make a sale, knowing that there were vulnerabilities. One of his companies was um, a dental software company. I won't name anybody. But they have this really cool dental software company. And if you go into your dentist's office and you see your teeth, and they take pictures of it and put in your notes and tag cavities and all this kind of stuff, that's probably the software he worked on. There's some major flaws in this software. But it shipped because he needed to get it out to the customer and commit to his scrum dates and levels. So we talk about DevSecOps, or whatever the current term is. Do we embed security guys into the dev team so that they can stop these things before they happen? I hope you're thinking about that, right? I mean, I love having the network guys so close because we can make the right decision at the right time and not have to worry about it. I mean, it's like having a network guy in my team and it's like having an email guy in their team or a communications guy in their team. And the more team sharing we do and the more open we are and the more like Ken we are and saying, nope, can't do that. That's a stupid security move. Don't do it. And I respect him for that. Instead of saying, Ken, I'm going to go over your head and I'm going to do my own shadow IT thing. So screw you, right? So that's what we need to do. Are we, are we so worried about the budget and making sure in a university model we're always building buildings? Are we making sure the ACC building product project is on time? Because you don't want IT to be the one that's out of scope. So we get things rushed. Think about this for a sec. The Equifax hack was an exploit that was nine years old. It was probably a solution that they deemed was working well enough to get the shareholders to buy in. I'm speculating, blowing unicorn glitter, right? But it was a nine year old hack. How many nine-year-old hacks do we have in our systems that are just waiting there? And I'm not talking about students and kids and people who work for you. So are you okay to accept this risk as a CISO? Or do you want to go out and buy one of these? Right? So the blinky box. Everybody's got a blinky box, right? And you walk into the data center nowadays and you notice that there's some boxes that like glow giant orange. It's like, come on, dude, just tone down the face paint a little bit, please. Just give me an on status indicator and a red green light. So do blinky toys and blinky products solve these problems? So I have the nine to five slide those nine to five security guys, right? I, I loved watching that keynote. The guy was on point, loved it. So I threw in a nine to five slide for you guys. So if you're a nine to fiver, <coughs> here's your blinky box. Ta-da, the internet. The internet in a box. And it's wireless, has an on off button. And the funniest thing was, you know, the, if you've watched this episode, uh, the IT crowd, Google it if you haven't. Um, the wall falls in and there's catastrophic things happening and people are dying and they're all rushing for the box on the internet. Why? It's a critical thing that they were poking fun at. Is because usually as security guys, we know the internet's not in a box. But sometimes above our level, they think the internet is a box. And they think a blinky toy will help solve everything, right? So there's a plug for the interesting keynotes <coughs> and our new friend Trevor. 
Um, remember Trevor? Yeah. Love the guy. So, so every vendor will come out to you and say, here's the peak. We're at the peak of expectations. We're cool. We're the best product out there. You know, if you install this blinky box, your problems will go away. You'll be able to replace five people with this blinky box. Right? And this is what the IT guy sees. I don't have another nine to five slide if you're in that crowd. Here's the nine to five Gartner. I had to throw the word Gartner out there so you guys would say, oh, Gartner. Gartner says it's true, it should be, right? Just like Deloitte. Sorry, whoops, not bad. <laughs> Gotta poke fun at them, so we think about it, right? We think about it. D do I wanna get caught in this hype cycle? Do I wanna get caught in this? Okay, I'll give you guys like 30 seconds to read all this, right? There is a lot of blinky boxes out there a lot of blinky boxes and some of them are really cool i own several blinky boxes right some of them are tried and true workhorses so what do i suggest here's what i suggest there are people at this conference sitting here right now like tyler and everybody else there's a guy up here in the upper left or upper right he's got a beard now Right, Luke. Find a good security guy. Find a great IT guy. And I guarantee you, you'll get more security out of him than you will a blinky box. Because this person, this Tyler in the suit, knows your infrastructure intimately. Right? He knows where the unicorn lives. He knows what to protect. He knows where the vulnerabilities are. And if you give them some time during the day to think outside the box, say, hey, Tyler, I want you to take the next three hours of the day and just go sit in one of those little phone closet rooms that we have in our building and lock the door and just stop thinking about work and thinking about what we should be doing. He, he might surprise you. He might come out and say, oh, dudes, we totally forgot we have this modem pool over here we forgot about 10 years ago right okay so now that you're going to hire cool people back doors and crap right and i say that actually in crap cleaner it's called cc cleaner now for the politically correct but it's crap cleaner and i have been not, I was not victimized by this hack, but I have used crap cleaner in the past, especially on my mom's PC. Oh my gosh. She calls me at least monthly, says, all the icons on my desktop are gone. I was like, yeah, I know. I'll take them out of the trash for you, mom. <laughs> but what happened to crap cleaner? Does anybody know the story there? This is a company that got bought out by Avast, Thank you. And it's a pretty cool product. It scans your Windows machine, tells you, hey, it's been a week since you've rebooted, you should reboot, right? <laughs> Cleans out all the crap that lives in there. And they have a key signing, code signing key. And the horrible thing about this hack was is that Crap Cleaner came out and was downloaded umpteen million times by people updating and it had a valid certificate, had a valid key. And the only way I can boondoggle my way into doing that is somehow inject infected source code into their build tree and let their automated Slack, Jenkins, whatever process, build it, sign it, and push it out. As we built this, we signed it, it's clean, it's out there. So it started with crap cleaner, but what's next? Here's a company that's taken some heat. They're connected with the government because they live in that part of the world. And they do antivirus stuff. And they do security scanning on your machine. 
So if you think about it at the basic level, we're letting not really an enemy of the United States scan our machines for vulnerabilities. And I'm just using this company as an example. I'm not saying, well, they did get caught doing this, right? So they're pretty much out of the market. Hopefully not, hopefully they can recover. They were a pretty good product. But what other products out there are we using that have code written offshore? Everybody, every one of these laptops out here and phones is running code written offshore somewhere. Depends on where your shore is, somewhere else. I opened my phone before I went to bed last night and looked at the latest swipe left Google News stuff. And I thought it was totally interesting. All these stories had to do about my talk. From right to left, Google Home. I just pre-ordered three of these, right? Because I need three for some reason. I need stereo homes. But I pre-ordered these and then I see this patch, Google Home needing a software patch to stop some of them, <coughs> translated all, of them from recording everything they hear. Not just, okay Google, See, heard it. Hello Siri, wake up, right? Do you guys know that there's, there's a girl on YouTube whose name is really Alexis Siri? She can't own any of these products. So Google has to send a patch. These things haven't even shipped yet. They have to send a patch to say, oops, uh, yeah, so your Google Home was recording everything and sending it to us. We don't wanna hear everything. We just wanna hear what's after the okay Google prompt. That was a bummer. Bitcoin in the middle. Bitcoin suffers from flash crash of popular currency. I mean, they're astronomical right now. They're over the 6,000 mark. And yesterday, because of something, they dropped $600? Okay, that's interesting. Right below that, NASA is running out of the most precious ingredient needed from future space missions. Can anybody guess what this is? Fusion? Who? People. Yeah, have you, have you guys seen the Mars One videos? And how they've selected these 12 people to go to Mars, and you watch the videos, and you're just like, oh my gosh, they're not gonna make it out of the atmosphere. <laughs> Seriously, my dad was a rocket scientist. And bless his soul, he was a rocket scientist and helped people live in the Apollo mission days but he could not talk to human beings, right? It, it, he would just, social interaction, he could not connect. But he was the perfect guy to engineer rocket systems that got the guys who could talk to each other to the moon and back, right? And we're gonna send all these guys and people and girls to Mars that don't have doctorates in physics or astrophysics, they're not rocket scientists. So NASA's running out of smart people, right? Um, far left, Dell bets a billion dollars on the Internet of Things. It's a hot term, he got some press on this. But the Internet of Things is exploding. I recently had to update my free license for my firewall because I hit 50 things in my house that had IP addresses. And I'm now closer to almost 80 things in my house. Everything you buy has an IP address. Phones, watches, tablets, smoke detectors, scales, fridges, Google Homes that record everything you say. Okay? And then the only one thing that wasn't security related is time to call the Chromebook the new tablet. Okay, yada yada. Okay. So what's next? What's the next technology hack that's coming up? People would like to know. Are you ready for that? Have you run a scenario in your organization where you said, hey, okay everybody, what happens if we get hacked? Run that scenario. What do your guys do? Try it. Big data, I love big data. 
that can tell us really cool things, right? Google announced recently that it can interpret voice from kids. I have a two-year-old grandson who goes up, okay, Google, okay, Google, okay, Google, okay, Google, okay, Google, and it just sits there and waits for him, and then it goes, blink. Yeah, see, my phone just did it. And it can hear him because they took a whole bunch of kids in and trained OK Google to respond to kids. And they're now at the response accuracy rate of 4% when the human brain is somewhere about 6%. Right? So they're more accurate than the human brain on responding to words. And that's because of the big data. Right? And they did a couple presentations on here is lens. We can take our camera and we can now identify objects in our camera. And the assistant, you can actually talk in a, your language and have the earbuds translate to the person you're talking to in another language. Think about pairing that with Google Glass, which was the Studebaker of its time. It was too far ahead. Having Google Glass sit there and you're going on a vacation in Italy the earbud on Google Glass is translating what people around you are saying in Italian into English so that you can talk to people. And it's also identifying objects. Hey, there's the Tower of Pisa. There's the Eiffel Tower. I know that's not in Italy, but you know, just go with it. Big data. So with that big data is the scare of, I like to point out things like for hospital, changing a blood type in one patient record. That should throw your security guys into a, just a panic. They should lose it. Because I know, can you identify that one patient that went from an A positive to an A negative on the blood type? Nope. No, nope, probably not. Because we have petabytes of stuff stored in pedophiles <laughs> laying around, right? that we can't identify. So big data scares the crap out of me. We actually had, at this last Ignite, my guys came back from Ignite and said, hey, they had this thing, a panel with 10 of the top 10 companies, right? And they all talked about their cloud experience. And all of them said, yeah, we're still in hybrid mode. But nobody explained why until the last guy. And the last guy went, he said, yeah, I'll explain it. It's because we're waiting for the cloud to get hacked and everybody to say, move me back, right? I, if you're a security guy, you gotta think, where's my prime target? Who gets to hack the Gibson, right? Who's gonna be the dude that takes AWS down or Google down or O365? I mean, right next to Trevor, is gonna go their name plaque right on the wall. And then the simple things. Do you enforce VPNs? Are you all on a VPN? Do you use your firewall guy and say, okay, Ken, go nuts. What do you want to do to make us secure? And he'll say, you got a VPN in with two-factor authenticated credentials or whatever they come up with three-factor next to get into any data. And I know he'd love that, right? Do you use the... Uh, the security conference Wi-Fi, right? To, so, raise of hands. Is the security con, Saint Con Wi-Fi to you more scary or less scary than coffee house Wi-Fi? Who thinks Saint Con is more scary than coffee house? Who thinks coffee house is more scary than Saint Con? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know that you can run the right thing personally, I know it. Right. On the other hand, I'm a little concerned for it. Yeah. I, I would I would think that way too. Okay, finally to the drone part. The doom is over. And we'll go to drones, more less doom. Okay, so evolution of the selfie. It's come quite a ways. So now we have things like selfie drones. 
right? And it's got the prop guards on, so I won't kill anybody. Um, but literally, you launch this thing out of your hand, and I'll show you in a second. But the selfie drones have grown to the point where they're this big. And they come in a box, this big or small. This carries all the accessories. But if I wanted to pack this up into like a little small box, it'd be really small. So what are drones good for nowadays in IT? Mapping is an amazing thing. You know, getting a campus map that's geographically accurate, right? Knowing how far it is from distance to distance. Yeah, we used to walk around with white poles and mark distance and get GPS locations of all our fiber areas and things like that. Um, one of my friends, Scott Pack, works for Adobe security team. His uh, BYU graduate study was a drone that flew around BYU and made an aerial map of the Wi-Fi data in that area. So the security guys could say, okay, look, here's this bleed out of this building that's hitting the hotel next door. How do we turn the AP so that doesn't happen anymore? And then we have some cool people in our con wearing the pineapple backpack, right? Put that thing on a drone. And now we're going to do something very Jedi-ish. We're going to try this. Okay, so all I do is I turn the drone on, right? And I hold it in front of me. I'm sorry you're sitting in the front row. <laughs> we'll see if this works. So with no other controller, I tap the back of the button twice. The camera in front scans me. and takes off. I can hold my hand out and hello, recognize me. I'm over here. Oh. Come on, land. It's a little confused. Okay, but in a less dense Wi-Fi area, what it would have done was I could have controlled it with my hand, turned around, taken a selfie, done this, and it would take a picture of me from 30 feet away, hold my hands up like this, and it would fly back to me and land on my palm. All without a controller, all without a phone, all without anything to do with this. So did the first time I feel like a Jedi doing this? Absolutely. Because it's cool to like, uh, uh, right? Do this, do that. So I'm sitting on top of a mountain climbing Timp, right? I want a selfie of the group. I do that. I wave bye to it. It goes out 30 meters. I take a picture of my group. I go like this. It flies back to me and lands on my palm. Okay, some natural parks, national parks are off limits now, most national parks are off limits. Some national icons are off limits, battleships, Cuddy Stark, you know, those kind of things. Don't fly over your capital, et cetera, et cetera. Don't be dumb, fly over people. Technology is getting smarter. I cannot fly this drone into a wall because it sees the wall, won't let me do it. Last slide. I can freaking fly with my hands. I am Jedi. I am Dave. Thank you very much. <laughs>